Hello, everyone. Welcome to DoorDash Technical Meetup event. This is our first FinTech event, which is hosted by our LA office. Now, a little bit about me. My name is Chalar. I've been uh, here at DoorDash for roughly one year. I lead the money team and also the site leader for LA office. On my free time, I love sur surfing, hiking, and camping. Now, let's take a look at money in DoorDash. So what do we do in Money Team? We do three things. We scale platforms, we build products, we make an impact. The team is going to focus on the first two, and I would like to briefly talk about the last one, making an impact. DoorDash has a huge business, which will not run smoothly without the work the Money Team does. We process millions of customer orders every day. We manage regular payouts for millions of dashers and merchants that use our platform. And we generate accurate financial reporting for the entire company. Now, where do we do all this? We do it in sunny LA. Uh, unlike other companies, our engineering team choose to put mission critical platforms in our satellite offices to attract the top engineering talent. Um, we launched last year in July and we grew our office from six engineers to 65 in less than a year. Now we are home to 170 cross-functional employees. Now let's take a look at the agenda. Uh, we'll kick things off with Brian, where he will be giving a brief history of money at DoorDash, uh, what challenges we are facing and how we are addressing them. Then we'll be having some lightning talks, first about our Dasher Direct product by Shushma and some technical challenges rolling out the UI by Shital. Then we'll talk about how we made our payment processor more reliable with multiplexing uh, which is going to be talked with Kevin. Lastly, we'll talk about how we make sure our financial reporting systems are accurate. This talk will be given by Yeti and Raj. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A. My team will be monitoring the incoming questions and will try to answer the short questions on the fly. For the long questions, we'll save it for the Q&A section. Also, please keep an eye out on the chat section as panelists might be sending out links. Now. Uh, we can switch it to Brian, where uh, he will talk about how financial platforms and products are central to DoorDash's business. Thank you. Well, hey everyone, my name is Brian and I'm here to talk about how financial platforms and products are central to DoorDash's business. But first a little bit about me. Um, so I'm currently a TL on the Dasher Payout Products team. I've been on the money team for about four years now, and I've been at DoorDash for just over six and a half. So I've seen it grow, grow from a small company of 23 engineers to the global company that it is today with over a thousand. And in my free time, I enjoy hot yoga, tennis, and running. And on the right is me running a Spartan race many, many years ago. Um, and I enjoy putting myself through that pain from time to time. Um, but we can start with an overview of the DoorDash money team. So in 2015, when I started, there was half a person on the team and that half person was me. Um, but fast forward a little bit, in 2018, we ended the year with 17 people and we had one team. That was a platform team and we we're handling pay in and pay out. And at the time we were handling roughly $2.8 billion of GOV. And that's short for gross order volume. And it's essentially a measure of how much payments volume we're handling. And at the end of last year, 2021, we had 65 people across three teams, platform, product, and intelligence, and we're handling roughly $41 billion of GOV. So if you look on the right, um, our GOV increased by 13 times, but our headcount increased by just under four. So we're definitely looking for help here <laughs> to scale to the GOV volume. So let's talk about some of the challenges that we have on, on payments. And they're currently categorized the three buckets. And the first one is reliability. So like all systems at DoorDash, uh, we wanna make sure that payments is reliable. Um, and it's especially critical for payments to be reliable because we're a part of the customer ordering experience. So if a customer can't pay, that means a customer can't place an order, it means that DoorDash loses that order and loses that revenue and merchants and dashers lose out on an earnings opportunity and customers don't end up getting their food and they get hangry. <laughs> so it's a lose, 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 lose for all parties involved. 
And the challenging thing here is that payments depends on third parties to actually process many of our payments. And like many of you know, um, external parties can go down any time. Um, maybe there's a deployment going on or a bug or some scale happens on their end. And so how do we sort of think about how we can make our platform resilient to failures from our dependencies and to ensure that customers can continue to place orders? And on the other side, when a customer actually places an order, um, it usually means that a merchant and dasher needs to be paid out. And to give you a sense of the scale here, we have 450,000 monthly active merchants, and we have over a million monthly active dashers. And many of these merchants and dashers depend on these payouts to run their business or pay bills or pay rent. And so it's especially critical that we pay them out on time. If you look at it from another lens, if we don't pay them out on time, then definitely impacts many things that are happening. Uh, sorry, it impacts um, all these things that they're trying to do with their money. And if we continue to have delays over time, then that means that merchants and dashers will trust us less and they'll churn from the platform, which means that consumers will have fewer ordering options and that the delivery experience will become less consistent. And so it's a negative feedback cycle that we definitely want to avoid. And so we have to make sure that our payouts are handled on time. So the second set of challenges that we have is related to convenience. And there's two categories here. Um, we know that dashers have a lot of options to work. There's the DoorDash platform, but there's also other gig economy platforms. And there's also contract work, full-time work, traditional work. There's a whole bunch of options there. And we know that earning money is a prim primary motivation for them being on the platform. So the idea is how can we sort of improve the payout experience on our platform? Um, and how can we make it not just competitive, but a competitive advantage for us? And on the merchant side, we have large grocery and convenience stores that want to join our platform, but typically they have their larger ins installations. So they might have hundreds or thousands of employees, tens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of stores. And so using our traditional tablet approach may not work for them. And to give you some context, uh, for a merchant group, we normally give out tablets where they can manage their orders. And so Imagine trying to install tablets at every single cashier in a traditional grocery store. There's just not that much space. And so we need to figure out a way for them to onboard onto the platform, accept payments. And yeah, how can we do that at scale? And the third set of challenges that we have is related to accuracy. So traditionally, DoorDash has had just a few simple systems and that was many years ago, but today, again, we're a big global company. And so we have many systems many teams, many services in place that handle financial data. And so how can we ensure that these systems are consistent at scale? And so let's talk a little bit about how payments try to address some of these challenges. And the first one is in the category of reliability. And it's kind of obvious, but it's not easy. Um, and what we do here is we add redundancy to payment processing. Back in the day, DoorDash, had one payment processor, and that made it very painful for us when that payment processor had issues. There weren't many outages, but when it did happen, it meant that we were losing tens, hundreds, and if not thousands of orders, depending on how long an outage or an issue lasted. So what we've done over the past couple of years is refactor our platform to allow for multiple payment processors. And over the last year and a half, we've onboarded one additional processor with more in the pipeline. And in addition to that, we've added some smart routing. So depending on the region and depending on the payment method type, we might be able to route certain payments to certain processors. So if we have a failure in Canada for a particular processor, then we're able to route payments away from that processor to another one. And in the case that there is a common failure, so for example, American Express um, might be down, then it doesn't matter which payment processor that we use, we're still gonna see failures. So we actually have this thing called command mode, which is pretty cool. We've had it for a while now, and it basically allows us to make async charges. So we'll essentially accept a payment and try to charge that payment method later. And we just make intelligent choices about which payments that we allow through, but it ensures that many of our customers can continue to place orders, even if our payment system is having issues. And in the next area of, the next area we handle convenience. So we were able to onboard grocery stores using red cards. Um, and so basically what we do here is we use what the grocery store already has in place, which is cashier with a terminal. And we make payments to that grocery store using credit cards or 
credit cards and debit cards that we give to our dashers. And the cool thing about this is that grocery stores don't have to change anything. And those charges that dashers make at the register for these grocery orders are sent to our platform in real time to be authorized. So if a payment happens to be a little bit higher than we expect, then we're able to decline that charge and send a message to the dasher that maybe part of the order is not correct. And same thing if the charge is under, um, might mean that an item is missing and we send that issue back to the dasher. On the other side, uh, we have Dasher Direct, which is the way in which we improve the dashing experience. So with Dasher Direct, it's a new program that Shishma will be talking about in more detail later, but with Dasher Direct, we're able to make payouts more quickly and in a cost-effective way using prepaid cards. And so after every single dash, we are able to make a payout directly to that prepaid card. So it gives Dashers access to their earnings basically within minutes. And the cool thing about this is that it basically gives Dashers more of a reason to use our platform and in different ways than they were expecting before, given that they're able to get their earnings basically right away. And the final thing that we have here is, is about accuracy. And we're able to monitor financial data across all of our various systems using a system we have called Revenue Subledger. And Raj and Yating will be talking about this in more detail later. But essentially, all the systems that we have at DoorDash emit events to a common stream where this system that we have on the infrastructure layer called Revenue Subledger ingests those events and generates reports. And these reports allow us to report on any inconsistencies that we have in, in various systems. So now that we've gone through some of the solutions, we can talk about the future just for a moment. So DoorDash, um, for some context, has a strong customer base, and we process a large volume of payments. So 10 million monthly active consumers, 1 million monthly active dashers, and 450,000 monthly active merchants. And we process $41 billion of payments every year. So the question here is like, how can we leverage that scale to provide even more for our customers versus the dashers? For every dollar that a customer spends on our platform, how can we make that dollar go further? And for every dollar that a merchant or dasher earns on our platform, how can we make that dollar go even further for them as well, or provide more earnings opportunities? And so that's sort of what we're thinking about here on the payments team. And if you're excited about that, um, we'd be happy to have you. And so I will now hand it off to Sushma to talk more about Dasher Direct. Thanks, Brian. Hi guys, I'm Sushma Lakaraju. I'm a product manager leading money products. And my role is to identify unmet financial needs for our key audience segments like Dashers and consumers and build solutions to meet these needs. Our vision here for Dashers is to become their preferred trusted financial partner and enable them to meet their day-to-day -day as well as long-term financial goals. We're just in the beginning of our journey and today I'm gonna to talk to you about how we enable instant access to Dasher earnings. DoorDash as a platform every single day is working really hard to improve our supply from the Dasher side to meet our constantly growing consumer demand. As a customer, I want my order to come reliably and on time. And as a Dasher, I wanna make the most money per hour. The challenge here is how do we incentivize Dashers to pick DoorDash as a platform of choice? Many of our initiatives involve incentive pay for Dashers. We thought of this initiative, which was focused on Dasher happiness. So our thesis was, if we can make dashers happy with their dashing experience, they may choose our platform over others, which will increase dasher supply. So we dug and dove into, the next slide please, what dashers care about. We did quantitative research, we talked to dashers one-on-one, -on -one, and we realized that there was this theme about focusing on dashers' financial needs which is not a surprise. The number one pain point that Dashers care about was uh, a lot about liquidity. Dashers come to DoorDash to enable their financial or life goals. No surprise there. But the reality was Dashers needed to wait one week to get their earnings. So there seemed to be a mismatch in what Dashers wanted to achieve and how we were allowing them to achieve that. So we came up with a hypothesis that if we can make dashers happier by giving them quicker access to their earnings, that would drive them to choose us 
DoorDash as a platform over other platforms or other jobs or gigs, and hence drive higher supply. So we focused our efforts on designing the solution to provide quicker access to earnings for Dashers. How would we measure success? We said, of course, Dasher happiness and NPS. Also, Dasher hours or supply, which we set out to influence. And then Dasher retention, does this make Dasher stay longer with DoorDash or do more with us? And we want to do this without additional support or fraud costs. As you can imagine, as we increase the frequency at which Dashers can access their earnings or make it quicker for them to access their earnings, the volume of payouts to Dashers increases, which may lead to questions from customer support. Similarly, there may be an increase in order volume if our supply went up, which also leads to customer support inquiries, which are all expensive. Similarly, we want to protect our Dashers from fraud, thus reducing fraud costs for DoorDash, which could come from fraudulent individuals taking over Dasher accounts or payment fraud where Dasher's earnings are being stolen by fraudulent individuals. How do we design the solution such that we meet these requirements and also future-proof it? When I talk about future-proofing the solution, what do I mean? We need to ensure that as the number of payouts increases from once a week to something more frequent, that DoorDash always and reliably pays Dashers the right amounts as quickly as they expect it, each Dash every day, for all Dashers currently in the network and also accounts for the growth of the Dasher network to meet our ever-growing consumer demand. So what did we do? We designed and launched a product called Dasher Direct. Dasher Direct is a prepaid debit card, which is exclusively for Dashers. It allows Dashers earnings to be deposited way faster at the end of each Dash instantly. Plus Dashers earn 2% cash back on gas purchases. Additionally, it comes with its own mobile banking app that will allow Dashers to access these earnings, pay bills, transfer funds, manage finances, manage their life. What did we see when we tested this? We saw an increase in all our success metrics. Dasher NPS went up and we heard quotes live from Dashers such as, I think DoorDash now cares about Dashers. DoorDash is a platform I trust. We saw an increase in supply hours unprecedented over the last several years, and we saw an increase in Dasher retention. They wanted to stay longer with the DoorDash platform. No additional support or fraud costs, which was also a win. Hence, we rolled out the solution to the entire Dasher network. And as I said earlier, this is just the beginning of our journey on financial products and solutions to enable Dashers to meet their financial needs. But now that this is available, how do we make sure that Dashers are aware of this? There's so many notifications that they receive when they're dashing. To talk a little bit more about how these can be prioritized through server-driven UI, here is going to be Sheetal, and I'll transfer over to her. Thank you, Sushma. Hello, everybody. Um, myself, Sheetal Jadwani, software engineer and Droid at DoorDash. I have been here for about six months and primarily focused on Dasher uh, financial products. Today, we are going to talk about in-app notifications and what were some of the challenges that we faced when we were working on Dasher Direct Instant Pay and how did we tackle them. Uh, as we can see on next slide, um, in-app notifications are very popular and widely used widgets across Android and iOS platform. It helps us to grab immediate user attention to piece of information. We have um, we we use in-app notification all across the app. For example, safety, legal, or red card related uh, notifications. So this widget provided us a very promising uh, opportunity to encourage dashers to sign up for Dasher Direct Instant Pay. So um, these are some of the examples like I talked about. Um, we have on dashboard, which is fast pickup uh, notification, in-app navigation, and we were working on Dasher Direct Instant Pay. So all these features gets developed at different point in time. But uh, so it's very uncommon that these uh, notification will overlap for most of the dashers. But still, there is a subset of dashers for whom this notification might overlap because um, 
this or any other future notifications that we are planning to put on dashboard might overlap. So now when dashes are out and about and they want to start dashing um, with lots of overwhelming information, they, they can be distracted and um, they tend to ignore this information. So when we were working on, um, as we can see on the next slide, when we were working on Dasher Direct Instant Payment, we wanted to promote this feature. Now, if the notifications are overlapping, our UI doesn't become so intuitive for Dasher, Dasher try to ignore the notifications. It was very challenging for us to promote and um, bring awareness amongst Dashers to Dasher Direct Instant Payment. So how did we solve this problem? As we can see on next slide, um, we can rank this notification. If all these notifications can be put in different buckets, like um, legal, safety, promotional, or informational, and uh, let server prioritize these notifications for clients because server has the best knowledge of Dash's context and criticality. And client can only show one notification which is most relevant to the Dash's at that point. So um, we can see on the next slide how we prioritize um, these notifications using runtime configuration. So uh, runtime configuration, um, runtime configuration is our in-house tool where which we can use to publish dynamic configurations and which will be deployed right away. So if we want to add new notifications or if we want to update the ranking of existing notification, we just publish our changes on runtime and it will be available right away to the server. So clients can simply request the notification from the backend server and backend server after fetching the rank notification from runtime can do its magic. The backend server will do the prioritization of different types of notifications and send down only the notification which is most relevant to Dashers at that point. So as we can see on the next slide that prioritization is helping us to, um, um, to solve the stacking notification issue but is prioritization enough? Let's say tomorrow we have new requirement where we have to show a safety related notification to all the dashes. What it would mean is we have to update all our clients. And we know that client updates are uh, very expensive because we have to implement those features. It has to be tested and then released to the market. Even after doing all this, we cannot guarantee that all the dashes will see this notification because not every client want to update the uh, application to the latest version. So um, this can uh, limit the product visibility as well. On the next slide, as we can see, um, we uh, propose the solution of server-driven UI along with prioritization. Server-driven UI drives the UI on mobile platforms. So with the initial investment on the client side, we guarantee that any future notifications can be just um, uh, can be displayed by updating our server and client updates are not needed. And since clients are not changing, um, we will have greater app adoption and it, which in turn gives us greater product adoption, which is a win-win. On next slide, we can see how we can um, use server-driven UI to, custom, to customize our notification. So um, for this type of notification, let's say there is an image and then we have bulleted text. Server can tell us that there is a bottom sheet component, which has a header component and bulleted text component and a button component. Or in the next slide, we have different, slightly different notification where we have header image component, title component, and description component. Or um, the simple example on the third slide is uh, where we just have title and description. So we see that uh, using server-driven UI, we can completely customize our notification without even changing the clients. And since clients are not changing, higher app adoption can return in um, greater product adoption. So if this, if this um, challenge, um, if this solution sounds challenging, please come and help us to take this to finish line. Um, thank you. And I will now pass it on to Kevin to talk about multiprocessor payment systems. Right. Thank you, Shell. Hey, everyone. I'm Kevin. Um, I'm a software engineer at the payments team in Dorash and here about three years. I'm here today to talk about how we utilize the multiplex the payment processing mechanism to help DoorDash uh, grow with his volume. 
In the next slide, we're going to brief talk about what are the problem we're faced and how we're going to solve it. As you can see in this picture, usually when consumers check out our internal payment service will send out a payment request to a third party vendor, it's usually called payment processor. And this payment processor will hand up or interact with card networks and banks to get the transaction through. And historically, DoorDash has been only integrated with a single payment processor. However, as our order volume grow in the past couple of years, uh, we really uh, realized this is a single point of failure and they can really fail at any time. In order to keep up with our growth, uh, we want to build a solution to provide a multiplex approach to further help us to grow. When we look at solution, really we're looking at a, two key items. And the first one is how to allow our customer only enter their card once, but build a world to allow multiple payment processors to access the card data for transaction. There are two fundamental approaches there. First one is built to build our internal vault system to store all the raw customer payment data. And the second one by to buy the tokenization services from third party wonder to leverage their service to help us store those pay raw payment data. Now let's take a look at the pros and cons. For the build option, apparently there isn't a vendor locking risk, but however, we have to deal with the PCI DSS compliance obligations for the entire DoorDash network on a day-to-day -day basis. And then for a buy option, we're gonna go with external tokenization and partner with the third-party vendors. The benefit of it is that we ship the PCI and compliance scope to the third-party vendor, and there is less engineering effort to integrate However, there's a minor cons there. It's like there is a potential vendor lock-in. In the next slide, we want to look at what are the high-level solutions we have there to help us scale there. So keep the efficiency, complexity, and cost in mind. We go with the buy option. As you can see in this picture, essentially when a customer add a payment card, we flow the roll card data into this tokenization wonder to help the card number being tokenized and de-scope the PCI, and then the, the tokenized card data being flowed into DoorDash's internal tokenization service and payment backend. And then we flow back this, to uh, this token data um, to the payment processors so that multiple payment processors can access those payment data with, um, however we want. So this is a solution for the first problem. Let's take a look at the second one. How can we ensure the ideal uptime with multiple payment processors out there? Essentially, we always wanted to send transactions to the most appropriate processor at runtime. And whenever there's one or more payment process goes down, we still want to ensure our payment APIs are up so that our consumers can always successfully check out. Let's take a look at what they would do there. So we build a rule-based transaction routing engine. Essentially, we're looking at two main areas. First one of it, we're trying to assign payment processors based on business rules such as payment method metadata, which, you know, like a Visa, MasterCard, or either, or does PayPal or Venmo, or the card is issued by Chase or some other banks. And then of course, depending on the nature of the purchase, we're gonna look at a compliance and financial rules to decide which are the processor we wanna route a transaction to. And then when there's any downtime or outages from the payment processors, we'll also enable and build a failover mechanism so that there is a smart retry if there's a degraded auth rate from a particular payment processor. And also there's an auto failover if there's any one of them have a degraded service availability. As you can see from this picture, when the customer tried to uh, try to check out the entire payment request right now going through these transaction layers and retry and failover mechanisms, eventually it's gonna reach a most optimal payment processors and then have the entire transaction processed through our system. So with this two key items solved, here are our results. We have a increased the payment processing uptime for DoorDash app, which is really a happy result for our own and for our customers, and better customer experiences and better scalability as we unlock ourselves from growing further. And of course, there's a huge benefit of a cost saving because you are integrated with multiple payment processors, there are gonna be way more competitive pricing from them. So what about next? In the next step, we're going to further enhance our smart routing engine to make it even smarter. We're going to look at even better optimizations for auth rate, latency, and cost efficiency. And for our developers and the engineering team, we hope to get a more rapid uh, processor integration experiences so that you can really do a plug and play engineering effort to bring in all the future payment processors. And on the recall and financial reporting area, 
we hope to reduce the complexity and improve the efficiency of the recon work streams. And I will say all of those future good steps are really depending on Titans as you join the force and help us to build the money feature of DoorDash. So with this, I'm handing off to Yating and Raj to talk about how we build an infrastructure to collect accurate DoorDash financial data. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kevin. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Yating, and I'm a software engineer here at DoorDash. I've been around for about six months now. And today I'm here uh, with Raj, who's a cool guy, to talk about how we build a, a reliable and accurate revenue platform here at DoorDash. So um, the goal of our revenue platform is super simple, uh, is to provide accurate and auditable financials for the company. So what that means is that for each delivery, we want to calculate the correct revenue and expenses and then book them at the right time. So what does that mean and how do we achieve that? Let's go to the next slide. So if we think about the life cycle of one delivery, we have a bunch of milestones. And in software, uh, like in software, those are events. So what we do here at Revenue Platform is that we'll listen to these events from different teams and try to extract any financial related data from the events. And after that, we try to aggregate them based on a globally unique identifier, such as delivery ID. So after we've done the aggregation, we apply a set of accounting rules to the aggregated data and we output journal entries, which is a accounting term uh, for that delivery. And if you think about it, this is only for one delivery and we're getting tens of events. So as DoorDash grows, we have millions of events flooding into our system and we are able to provide accurate financial reporting at a delivery level granularity. So let's take an example in the next slide. So at the bottom, when the Dasher drops off the order, we're able to finalize our, um, our pay to the Dasher. So the drop-off event itself is very simple. Um, so this order has been dropped off. So how much did we pay the Dasher? We actually need to go back to a previous event from a different team to figure that the base pay was $10. And how are these connected? So the events are connected by a shared ID or the ID 1234. And this is when the aggregation comes into play. So we're already talking about a complex data pipeline here, but we also have some other challenges. So in the next slide, um, so the first challenge we have is we our accounting requirements are constantly updating as DoorDash grows. It could be a change to existing rules or when we explore a new vertical, uh, we need a new set of rules applying to it. The second ch challenge we have is that up to this point, we are assuming that everything is in order, um, but that's not the case. So as you can see, we're listening to these events from different team and they might publish at their own pace. So it's likely that in our platform, we first see an order has been dropped off and then later we realize it's being placed. So we need a way to deal with that in our system. And the final challenge, which we are still working on is to detect failures in real time. This is critical to our financial reporting, but it also has very cool side effects. Um, so what I mean by that is, um, we can act as the safeguard for our stakeholders. So um, say in one pay period, we can compare how much we owe the Dasher for each delivery and the actual payout amount to the Dasher. If the amount don't match, then we know something's wrong and we can loop in support as soon as possible. Now I'll pass on to Raj to talk about how we solve these challenges. Um, thanks, Yating. Um, accounting rules change all the time. For example, we change the way we add incentives to dashers or we create new verticals. These accounting rules change on a weekly basis. So the way that we process these accounting rules also change over time. We'll have new features, uh, we'll have improvements added to our platform. We will also have new set of events that we need to onboard. So how do we handle these changes? Separation of concerns. We break the system into two separate parts. We have declarative language that describes these accounting rules. The language has to be backward compatible, has to be readable, it has to be intuitive. We have a rules processing engine that processes these event rules. This way, both can change independent of each other. Events can come in any order, whereas our rules 
make simplistic assumptions about the order of events. Like, how does the rules processing engine handle this? So we built a versioning system. The state that the engine maintains is always consistent and corresponds to a happy path. When we get an out of order event, we roll back the state to the previous, you know, would be consistent state. And we replay this event and we replay all the events uh, that follow this event. So this way we always maintain the happy path. So how does the future look for us? Look like for us. The revenue numbers we generate always have to be accurate. If there's a problem, you want to detect it as soon as the problem occurs. What if the events are missing? What if they are invalid? What if they are incomplete? What if there is inconsistency between multiple events? Can we correct it automatically? So we are planning to build a real-time error detection system called Health Checker uh, that actually monitors all these events and checks for completeness, correctness, and validity. We are also building a self-healing system that corrects these errors, errors automatically. So we are looking for next innovation that outpaces DoorDash. DoorDash started with restaurants. Now we have convenience and groceries. We have Ship Anywhere. We have Dash Pass and also Dash Mart. So we are adding new features. We are growing internationally as well. So there's a lot of great stuff happening here at DoorDash. Can revenue platform outpace this? Can we always be ready for what is next? What do we need to get there? So we are looking for talents like you to help us achieve this innovation at the revenue platform. Thank you. Next, Chalar uh, will be taking up the Q&A session. Hello, everyone. Um, we answered some questions, so maybe we can get the panelists back in. All right, I uh, got one question from here. Uh, maybe this is a panel's question, and we can take it. Do you think the work you are doing is helping you grow your career? Who would like to take it from the panelists? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I can get started here. Uh, I'm sure there's multiple opinions here uh, that are hopefully all similar, but. Um, I th think it is. Um, luckily for me, uh, I joined the payments team about four years ago and I had no experience, but I think over the past five to 10 years, the payment space has grown incredibly and it's evolved rapidly, which means that uh, we've had to do a lot over the past five years to evolve with the payments ecosystem. And so with that, I mean, you build new things, you learn new things. Um, and so I definitely think that's a yes from my point of view. And we'll pick uh, someone else to answer as well. Maybe uh, see a different question, actually. Let's change it up. Uh, how does the money team fit in with the rest of the DoorDash? Isn't DoorDash primarily building a marketplace? And uh, who would like to take this question? Yeah, I can, I can give an intro and then maybe people can jump in. So uh, yes, DoorDash is primarily a marketplace. And, and the way DoorDash thinks about ourselves is we have, we are a three-sided marketplace. So we have three distinct audience or customer segments. We have consumers, we have dashers, and we have merchants. And uh, we as a platform are trying to up-level the game and make everybody happy and make sure that we're meeting the demands and needs of every single audience segment. Money is the common thread <laughs> that runs across all these audience segments is what I would say. As consumers, place their orders, they pay for their orders, they get discounts, and hence they have credits, they apply those towards their orders, they're delighted in how they ordered something on DoorDash, and all of that involves 
what consumer payment methods we accept on the platform, how easy and delightful do we make it for consumers to use DoorDash to complete their primary task of getting the food they love uh, or ordering groceries they love or, or whatever they choose to do. Similarly, on the Dasher side, as we just spoke about it, Dasher has come to the platform for a goal, for a purpose, for a passion. And our goal is to make sure that we enable solutions that help them get paid on time and as expected. So the whole DoorDash platform helps solve these kinds of needs for consumers and Dashers. Merchants and merchant selection is what creates the marketplace. And they are here to ensure that they have as much access to consumers, fulfill their demands on time, and also get paid accordingly from DoorDash. So I think this is an ecosystem which appears as a consumer marketplace, but money is a common thread that runs through every single need that is met for each audience segment. Thank you for that detailed answer, uh, Shushma. Uh, another question, live question that just came in. Uh, is our team hiring? Yes, uh, definitely. We have many roles. Uh, I think we will share it with the chat. And um, let's see. Another question. What is the work culture at DoorDash like? Uh, maybe we can pick uh, Shital to answer this one. Yes, um, I have been here for six months and I have enjoyed every day coming in office. Um, we always look forward to helping each other. We, uh, everybody on the team is um, very supportive and um, we uh, actually um, like to solve the problem as a team together. It's always like one team, one, one, uh, one, team, one solution here. So yes, it is very exciting and um, I always look forward to come and help you. Then maybe we can take one more technical question around our uh, revenue sub ledger systems. Uh, replaying upon receiving an out of order event is interesting. Why do we need to replay and what tech stack do we use for that? Maybe Raj can help answer this question. So uh, we want to make uh, accounting rules simple, right? So we want the accounting rules to be such that, you know, when you have event A, event B and event C, then do X. So in reality, events don't always come in order. We use Kafka message queue, and uh, but every service handles these events differently. So it's possible that we get event C, event B and event A. So we need to handle out of order because our engine and our, we, made, we wanted to make the engine complex enough and rules simple enough such that this out of order should not, uh, or rather rules should not assume that, you know, events can be out of order. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the second part of the question? I think it was which tech stacks are we using to achieve this? Um, we actually build the solution ourselves. We just uh, use Kotlin uh, as a language and uh, we use uh, CockroachDB uh, as a distributed database, distributed NoSQL database, but most of the logic is custom built. Okay, and maybe a version of this, I think is similar to the payment platform. Uh, maybe this question, uh, Brian can help answer about the uh, tech stack that we use for the money platform team. Yeah, I think uh, I answered one of these questions already, but I'm happy to answer in the live. Um, so on payments, we have a kind of a monolith legacy with legacy system, which is in Python, but we have a bunch of new services that we've built over the past year that are using the default stack that we have that Raj mentioned, which is going to be in Kotlin. And a lot of our data is stored in Aurora Postgres, but like Raj also mentioned, we're moving a lot of those workloads to CockroachDB, which is a scalably horizontal SQL store. So yeah, those are the main elements of our tech stack. And uh, let's see. There's a lot more questions around culture. Maybe we can get another opinion from Kevin. We got the opinion from Shital as a new person and Kevin who has been here for uh, longer time, maybe you can share your experiences on the culture at working at DoorDash. 
Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's definitely a good question to uh, to ask. I've been here about three years. What I feel about the entire engineering work and also the entire DoorDash company as a whole, I feel like everyone is very efficient and open-minded that we can always collaborate all together. It's not only within the same team or within the same org. You can always work across org depending on all different like initiatives and problems you're trying to solve. In general, whenever you need help, just speak out and people will jump in to help you. And you're gonna learn a lot from each other and grow over time. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a question around how is the feedback from dashers implemented? Uh, maybe. Uh, Shushma, you can take this one. Yeah, sure. So we get feedback from dashers qualitatively, meaning we, we talk to them or we go dashing and then we find other dashers and, and get feedback from them. We have uh, research sessions. We also have a dasher community council at DoorDash. We attend these sessions to hear what's top of mind for them. And we also do time to time surveys with dashers either through the newsletters that we send them by sending them a question where we want their opinion every single week, or we send a quantitative survey on a particular theme to see what their feedback is and, and gather themes from there. Once we receive this feedback, our key focus is on identifying what are the problems that come to the top? What are the key themes in the unmet needs that are rising to the top? And then we sit down and try to understand for the problems that are coming to the top, what would be a perfect hypothesis for a solution? In an ideal state, what would the solution look like from a customer experience perspective? And then we say, how would we measure success for the solution, given the problem that we're hearing within Dasher's feedback? Once we realize and get to a sense of, yes, this is what success means, at that point, we start thinking about how could we solve for this and think about tangible solutions. It could be the payments team partnering with the dashing team, partnering with another team within DoorDash. And, and all of us are working together with, with the great, my great engineering peers here and, and sitting in the same room and thinking about how do we ensure we solve the core problem we set out to solve and how do we test into that uh, within our roadmap while starting small with small tasks, learning and iterating on it to build a delightful experience. So that's typically our process for taking feedback from dashers and evaluating what are the key problems that we should be solving to not have uh, that particular kind of feedback and then work from there towards uh, a problem and solution approach. All right, uh, another good question uh, coming in, thanks for the event, you talked about uh, reliability, convenience, and accuracy. Can you briefly describe scaling challenges? Like how do you handle spike in order in specific region and reliability issue that may arise from that? Maybe uh, uh, Ryan can help answer this given that he has seen scale from early days. Oh, uh, sorry, I was uh, actually uh, responding to one of the questions in the Q&A. Um, sorry, what was the, uh, the quick question here? Yeah, I'll just read it again. Uh, thanks for the events. You talked about reliability, convenience, and accuracy. Can mm -hmm. you briefly describe scale, some of the scaling challenges, like how do you handle spikes in orders in a specific region and reliability issues that might arise from that? Um, yeah, so right now, uh, I. Chilar was mentioning, like historically, we've been in sort of one region, um, and infrastructure wise, we've been in one region, which is US West 2 and AWS. Um, I mean, luckily, our payment spikes um, have been manageable, but back in the day, we definitely had issues with our data store. Um, and mostly that was because we were using stock Postgres. And sorry to get a little bit technical here, but we were using stock Postgres and not what we're using today, which is Aurora Postgres. So stock Postgres has a certain scaling limit, and we ran into that multiple times. Um, so that was one of the early, early challenges. And then I think a few years ago, we made sort of the transition from stock Postgres to Aurora, Aurora Postgres. So that bought us a lot of headway and headroom. Um, and we still have a little bit of headroom there, but sort of to preempt our 
um, our scale and to go multi-region, um, we are sort of switching some workloads to CockroachDB. Um, and so that's the main aspect of our scaling challenges, which is around the data store side. So um, let's go with another one. Uh, I saw you picked VGS as your vaulting solution, curious why, and are there any other options out there? Uh, maybe Kevin can help answer this. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we have been partnered with uh, VGS, our like primary like tokenization providers. Uh, for all the tokenization initiatives, it's actually not only limited to payment systems. There are other parts of the DoorDash system that dealing with like a critical data or PIIs that we wanted to externalize the, the compliance scope to uh, from the DoorDash network that will also work on uh, this integration together with VGS. And there's a certainly other uh, wonders that provide a similar uh, solutions, but by looking at the, the capabilities and uh, the, the engineering uh, or technology uh, scale and, and, and capacities where we decided to go was VGS. Another product question. Uh, thanks for the event. Uh, and uh, how does DoorDash decide between building an in house product system and using something an existing one? Maybe this can be a two parter. Maybe we can pick another engineer and product to start. Uh, Shushma, uh, you want to take the product side and maybe we can take, uh, let's say, Yating to pick up the engineering side. Sure, yeah, absolutely. I think that's always the key question in our minds, whether we should build something ourselves from the get-go or should we use something existing or an existing partnership or tool or solution to first learn our way into the space so that we can up level and build delightful solutions for, for our dashers going forward. So it's, it's always a difficult question to answer. I don't think there is a set response. Honestly, it differs from problem to problem, but usually our principle, one of our leadership principles is dream big and smart small, start small. So what that means is essentially, as you're resolving a big problem or even a small problem, start small, think about how is it that you can get quick learnings. And that may initially mean you depend on other solutions that are systematic in nature or solutions you've bought off the marketplace or partnered with others. And then as you grow and get learnings, how do you integrate it into the current experience for our key audiences? Yeah, Ting, I'll invite you to add more. <laughs> Yeah, I also agree that this is a very hard problem to answer. Um, but in our team, for example, the subledger we're building, um, it is the use case is very specific to the business we're running. We have multiple stakeholders. We break our financial reporting to even a few cents granularity. And I don't think there's anything in the market that can do that, uh, which is why we're building it in-house. So uh, to your question, I think from the tech side, it really depends on what is best for our customer and how can we improve their experience. There is uh, quite a bit of questions around coming in for other countries, given that DoorDash is a global company. Uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about that in payment in other countries. So how do we think about how do we handle it? Kevin, you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. So there is a multiple aspect of it as our business get tapped into different countries and reasons. Like the first thing we want to solve is like the payment processors that we have been partnered with. We're going to look at whether they have the capabilities to do the transaction processing. Is there any certain limitations in that particular reasons and due to various reasons, if either infrastructure or regulation or compliance. And then because right now we have the this capability of partner with like multiple processing partners we have our um, like power to try to pick the most optimal ones and help us to launch our services in the corresponding region and countries. And then from the infrastructure or network layers, I think um, Brian has talked about it a little bit in the previous questions, we're looking for um, scaling up our services with more powerful like data infrastructure, such as CockroachDB and also multi-region initiative within a company gonna help us to uh, provide more available and scalable services across the globe.
Uh, got it. Maybe we can do a couple more uh, questions. Uh, one of them is, uh, when was the last time this org had an incident or outage? What does incident response process look like when things break in production? Uh, well, we can, <laughs> so I can, maybe do, we can answer two ways. We can give this one first to an engineer and then I can help answer as a manager. Uh, so uh, Brian, you wanna take this one? We have seen fair, <laughs> fair shares of uh, incidents in your time here. Uh, no, I was just going to say, I think uh, Kevin is probably closer to some of the more recent outages uh, that we've had. So maybe I'll defer to him on this one. Uh, Kevin, you're on the hot yeah. <laughs> I, I bet everyone liked this one <laughs> in multiple ways. Yeah. So usually I, I think as a general practice in most of the cap companies, we do have our own like on-call rotations. We have like pager duty integrations. Uh, we have like pretty sophisticated monitoring and learning system uh, built in with payment and also the DoorDash entire like marketplace and order systems. Whenever there's an incident happen, we got notified and page instantly. Um, the most uh, recent outages, I will say, I think it's actually one or two weeks ago, there's like a um, couple glitches with our payment processors or internal infrastructures. And, and the way we handle that is like basically the engineer or on calls get notified within a couple of minutes. And we immediately have those levers either automated or uh, signed manually to uh, twitch the uh, uh, the switches to write uh, route the traffic to the uh, to the optimal ones to the available ones or try to work with our um, infra team to solve the infrastructure layers of problem altogether. And because of we have built a multiple layers of retry and async queuing, um, in the end, so majority of the those incidents are actually not super impactful to our customers. So, and I'll take the, as an engineering leader, the responsible for money, uh, this section. Um, a few things, uh, I wish I can like, you know, write it on the walls everywhere. Everything fails all the time. I think it's about building defenses against these failures, removing the single point of failures where we talked about, like Kevin talked about, and actively, uh, you know, trying to monitor it and being more proactive rather than reactive. And also as an engineering leader, the way I look at it is as a learning opportunity. Uh, we embrace the failure. Uh, we try to learn as much as possible. And uh, we even publish our, some of our learnings. If you go to our engineering blog, I'll share the link. Our uh, VP, uh, Ryan Sokol, writes out about June 19 outage, which was a very big outage. And coincidentally, I joined uh, in April. So that was my early days, but it was a very good experience. And out of that, we came back with a lot of learnings and we shared it with the uh, uh, whole world. So. I'll share that link shortly. Um, yes, I think this was the last question. So you can still reach out to us. We will share some of these links and recordings later. Uh, thank you very much for your time and your participation. Really interesting questions. They are still keep on coming. I'll try to answer them all. Uh, thank you very much again and uh, be on the lookout for our next events. Thank you. <laughs>